wanted to start with a verse. I don't see Barry. There's Barry. Could you uh, work the computer for me? When I was looking for text for, uh, for today, it was really easy to find texts on the greatness of God. I think we could have just read texts um, for the whole, for an hour or two or three and uh, not, not covered very much. But if we go to Psalms 145.3, I think it should be popping up there pretty soon. It's, uh, in fact, the, the entire book of Psalms 145 is, is, you could just read the whole chapter and, and several other chapters. But verse 3 says, Great is the Lord. He is worthy of praise. No one can measure his greatness. And then it goes on, on verse 8, The Lord is merciful and compassionate, slow to get angry, filled with unfailing love. The Lord is good to everyone. He showers compassion on all his creation. All of your works will will thank you, Lord, and your faithful followers, that's us, will praise him. They will speak of the glory of your kingdom. They will give examples of your power. They will tell about your mighty deeds and about the majesty and glory of your reign. For your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. You rule throughout all. I just thought, wow, that, that to me was really amazing. But just spending time trying to describe this whole idea of how great God has just made me feel so tiny and insignificant. And yet I think it's so important that I, I got to give it a shot. And I think sometimes if you get back to some of the, well, a couple weeks ago, Pastor Steve referred in his sermon to uh, something I've said to a few people about how God was go might even change the day of his coming so that he could catch me in a theater. Because I was taught that if you went to the theater, you were going to hell. And I literally would come out of sneaking into the theater and no one would know and no one would see me. And I would sneak out and Ellen White said there'd be a little cloud the size of a hand up in the heavens. And I would come out of the theater and I'd look up and I'd say, oh good, no little cloud, he's not coming. I thought he might come when, I, when he caught me in the theater and they wouldn't have to save me. And so if your idea was somewhat like mine, same harp, same cloud, boring. Uh, not really the accurate picture of who God is and how we're going to spend eternity. I think the eternity that we're going to enjoy, we're going to be learning more about God every day, every year. A million years from now, we won't fully understand who he is and how awesome he is. Now, I'd like to say a uh, long time ago uh, and have a nice story for you, but all I got are some happiness quotes. And hopefully you'll enjoy some of these. I am absolutely convinced it is a sin to be unhappy. A big sin. It's a statement to God that he blew it. Uh, for every minute you are angry, you lose 60 seconds of happiness. Everything has its wonders, even darkness and silence, and I learn whatever state I may be in, therein to be content. You know who said that? Helen Keller. Um, love is that condition in which the happiness of another person is essential to your own. Folks are usually, usually about as happy as they make their minds up to be. That was Abraham Lincoln. Uh, it isn't what you have or who you are or where you are or what you're doing that makes you happy or unhappy. It's what you think about, Dale Carnegie. Uh, let's see, one more. Uh, happiness is having a large, caring, loving, clo no, we've got to do one more. A large, loving, caring, close-knit family in another city. <laughs> that was George Burns. Um, don't want to stop with that one. So uh, the Constitution only gives people the right to pursue happiness. You have to catch it by yourself. That was Ben Franklin. Well, that's not a good one to stop on either. Let's see. Those who are not looking for happiness are the most likely to find it. 
because those who are searching forget that the surest way to be happy is to seek happiness for others. Martin Luther. Whoa, okay. I guess the wire does make a difference. Um, there's sort of four things that I would like to uh, highlight today. And really all four of them are kind of similar. And it, the whole thing is kind of based on how my understanding of God has changed through my own personal journey. And I suspect most of you are on a similar journey, maybe learning different things than some of the things I learned. And then there's a couple sections there where I just want to share a couple of blessings within the last two weeks or so that the Lord shared with me that I, I found just really exciting. So I'm going to talk a little bit my personal journey, talk about the idea of each of us having a picture of God, this idea of kingdom of heaven, and, uh, and did Jesus have to die to appease an angry God? So when I think about my own personal journey, I started out with a strong belief that there was a natural explanation for everything. And I remember people saying, well, God did this or that, or this was a miracle or something else happened. And years ago, I would always say, no, let me tell you, tell me whatever it is, I, I should be able to find a natural explanation for almost anything. And that worked great until the 1990s when I saw some stuff I just never expected. And I don't want to spend time on how the Lord touched my hands and they got hot and different things happened. And it was like, I can't explain this. I can't explain him talking to me in English. And then I ask a question and he answers. And one of the things I remembered was my son being there for those series of meetings with Ian Geller. And he's a guy, his dad works at the conference office down in La Sierra, and he'd never been exposed to anything like this. And he was just visiting with er with Eric when Eric and him were teenagers. And as Ian was there and Ian was up praying, this kid came forward to be prayed for. And I'm watching as he's slain in the spirit, and he's flat on his back, he's out. And I'm thinking, this kid doesn't, he's never seen any of this. He's never been to a room or anything like someone falling down into the power of, of the Spirit, he's never seen that happen in his life. And there he is, and he's on the floor. And I think, wow, what a testimony to God. And as we see things, sometimes things like that happen. The one I, situation I do want to mention for me personally, and those of you that are medically oriented can tell me how often it happens, because for 20-some years, I had blown a disc out of my back, and I experienced excruciating pain. Uh, several doctors had MRIs done. It showed that the disc that's supposed to be a certain thickness, and it's plump with liquid, and when they, they do some of these tests, they can measure the amount of fluid, and the fluid went out of the disc. It was wedge-shaped, almost touching on one side, thicker on the other side a different color than all the others, which indicated that there was no liquid in there. And I just, for some reason, didn't, wouldn't agree to the surgery. And it got a little bit better, but any slight movement, and it would just be horrible again. And just a few years ago, I think af it was after Naomi and I were married, I just knew something was different in my back. And I knew it had been prayed for by lots of people. And I was just sure something was just weird. I did not have the pain that I'd had for 20-some years. Couldn't understand it. And I had a doctor's appointment, so I said, would you please do a test on my back? And he said, I don't, we don't need to do that. Back's fine. And I said, no, 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 I want to see an MRI. I want to know what's going on with the back. So they did an MRI, and that previously dry and wedge-shaped disc is now normal thickness and normal fluid. Now, I don't think that happens real frequently. It just might be something that's hard for me to explain. But it affected a lot of my beliefs. For most all of my life, I attributed speaking in tongues to the devil. The Bible doesn't say that, but I thought it did. My, my view of Sabbath observance and everything else was very much, personally, very much law-based. And I 
the one thing I thought that would never change for me if I lived to 200 years is I'd never change. This is absolute. This, this is the truth that makes us better than everybody else. Didn't turn out so good that way either. How some of these changes uh, have taken place, and I come to this place of he really is on my side. He truly does love me. He's not against me. He's always good. He's never bad. Well, there's bad stuff that happened. He told the Israelites to kill everybody, man, woman, child, pets, everything. How, you know, what kind of loving God is that? Well, I wish I could tell you how to answer that. I don't know. But I am confident in the next few million years that I'm going to find out. Because I know that my God, God the Father and God the Son, I know that Jesus is the full representation of who that God is. And I know how God is love. And so there is an explanation. Sorry, I don't have all of them yet. Uh, I would like, uh, Barry, if you could uh, go to the little joke I wrote. Uh, I was hoping very much, uh, well, we're a couple of slides behind, one slide, two slides behind there. That's kind of the outline that I've been going over. But if you go ahead a, a couple of slides to yeah, that one, and then one more. Actually, two more. One more time. There we go. Uh, I was hoping Roger wouldn't be mad at me, but I had this idea because I was, didn't have any jokes. And these two guys are talking. Do you really believe there's a God? And the next one? Of course not. There's no God, and he knows it. <laughs> and it was really funny because I'd already written this out, and Thursday morning I spent time with Tom and Carolyn, and we spent a blessed time together talking and praying, and, and the Lord always gives them words, and I'm just so totally blessed. And I was telling them, if you've got any really good stories, I'd like to hear them because I really need some some kind of jokes or illustrations or something all, all i got is sermon junk and i want some funny stuff and so uh peter was sitting in the corner working on his computer their son and he said i've got one and he told that story to me that was already written in except he told it that he was in a bar in the sky and they were having a big argument and, uh, i'd have to leave out and bleep some of the words etc but in the end Kind of the same thing happened. Uh, your picture of God, in, in my view, kind of changes everything. And what I want to suggest to think about for a minute, that doesn't necessarily just mean Christians. Your view of God as an atheist affects every part of your life. Your view of God as an agnostic affects every aspect of life. It doesn't matter if you believe God exists or you don't believe God exists. Your picture of that there is no God whatsoever, that affects how you make decisions, right? Uh, have, I did find some illustrations, so I'm going to use one here, but this was really cool. I, I, was, I was shocked. I had no idea. Um, I'm reading about this guy. His name is Major Denny Dunnigan. Uh, he has a picture of him here in his military uniform. Uh, he's like a highly decorated Marine, and uh, he, he's done all kinds of things as a Marine. He's, he's had a lot of Marine training, and he's been in live combat. He's, he's really a tough guy. But do uh, you know how he got into this illustration? Something he was ashamed of, and he never told anybody, not even his wife, for many, many, many years. And that is that when he was a young boy, Donnie was a child actor, and he was handpicked by Walt Disney to be the voice and the lead character in the 1942 classic movie named you imagine what movie in 1942 that Walt Disney picked this future Marine to be the, the key star of? Bambi. 
We, you know, you look at, he didn't want his wife to know that he was Bambi. He certainly didn't want his buddies in the barracks to know that he was Bambi. Uh, sometimes what we see on the outside is not what's really there. And uh, he looks kind of tough in the picture, too. But no matter what we are, if, if we're a Christian, some, sometimes we believe God's just not really involved. He's, yeah, there's a God. He's just a blob out there somewhere, doesn't do anything. Or, or he's the judge, and, he, and he's watching to catch us at stuff. Or he's kind of a cosmic cheerleader. Or He really is the loving God who intimately cares about every aspect of our life. And when you think of how you view God, in my case, it changed so much. A God that was out to get me. I, I saw that sickle in his hand when he's coming in the clouds with all the white angels. and He's on the throne in the middle and he's coming down. And the only thing I could see for sure was the sickle in his hand. And that sickle was to take my neck off. That's what that was for. It's not really who he is at all. And I, I just sort of suggest that you think about that for some time in the next week, but how does it affect marriages and relationships? How does it affect what we do at work? One of the things that's happened to me in this process of, of recognizing God as a whole different entity is this concept of honesty and transparency. Things I used to say and do, not horrible things, but... As a hospital it's administrator or CEO, it's really hard to be transparent and honest. When someone asks you a question, man, if you answer it directly, you're getting fired. Yeah, some of those things kind of change. Parenting, what you buy or don't buy, how you relate to your neighbors, what kind of a citizen we are, how we worship, all everything, I think, is affected by what we believe about God. Now there were a couple of things that I mentioned happened really just in the last few days. And uh, I, uh, I wasn't really planning to use this one, but it's too good to leave out. Uh, I mentioned to Naomi this morning, I didn't know that there was a park in Murfreesboro, Arkansas. And that particular park is called the Crater of the Diamonds. Have you heard of it? Anybody know about the Crater of the Diamonds? Yeah, there's one. I didn't know about it. This is a park. It's 37 and a half acres, I think I re read. And somehow, the way the Earth evolved, a bunch of diamonds kind of erupted in this little place in Arkansas. And they've made a park out of it, and anybody can go there. I don't know if there's an admission fee or not. I didn't say. But you can look around in the dirt and poke around and look for diamonds. And uh, I was thinking, yeah, right, you're going to find diamonds. Well, they're talking about this person, Bobby Os Oskarson, O-S-K-A-R-S-O-N, of Longmont, Colorado, was at the park recently and found a clear white icicle-shaped gem, the fifth largest diamond found in the park, 8.52 carats. And I'm thinking, okay, you find one, but that's it. But in the last 12 months, 227 diamonds have been found in the park. And they say that because, you know, it gets picked over every once in a while, the park people go in there and they turn it over and, and so that there are more... Um, diamonds that come to the surface so people can more easily find them. Um, it seems to me that for me personally, the diamonds I got the last couple of weeks I want to share with you are some of my favorites that I didn't even know about. And uh, there should be one up there that says uh, Kingdom of Heaven. Now, this is a concept that I don't know why I hadn't thought of or wasn't aware of. I'm sure Pastor Steve knows about it, but I didn't. And that is, when you look at the book of Matthew, Matthew refers to the kingdom of heaven many times in the book of Matthew, right? So if you're wondering, well, what in the world is the king of heaven? What, 
What do you think the, king of, the kingdom of heaven is? What, what, is, what does that mean? Yeah. Huh? God's heart? Okay. Kingdom of heaven. What I'm, what I'm kind of thinking that some of us do is we look at the word, and you can say kingdom. What does a kingdom look like? What? Yeah. Oh, gosh, God's heart. That's a good answer, by the way. I, I'm looking for the wrong answer right now. But the idea of kingdom brings what to mind? Can you think of a kingdom on earth somewhere? Yeah, a king over a, a realm. Uh, there's, the, there's a king and queen of England. And some of the kingdoms have fallen now. The Tsar of Russia is no more. Uh, America never had a king. But you think of a kingdom being some geographic area ruled by somebody. And if you have a kingdom of heaven, where is it probably located? In heaven. So we have some kind of a thing that I sort of referred to as pie in the sky by and by. Um, it's a kingdom that God has promised that he's going to come someday and, and take us to or whatever. What's interesting is when you get through Matthew and you start reading Mark and Luke, Mark and Luke don't talk about the kingdom of heaven. They talk about the kingdom of God. So you just jumped ahead to Mark and Luke. That's why. So now we're not talking about this heaven somewhere far away by and by. Now we're kind of looking at this idea of, of God. It's the kingdom of our God. And it may not be just the kingdom by and by. In fact, think about it a minute. Does God, or do we have multiple gods? I mean, we have a three and one God, but it's really one God, right? And does he have lots of kingdoms? You might, so, you know, this side goes to kingdom A and this side goes to kingdom B and these sides, this middle part's really lucky because we go to kingdom C. No, it, God, God has a kingdom. And he talks so many times about how the kingdom has come on earth as it is in heaven. So not only is it a kingdom sometime, it's a kingdom now. Um, again, I go back to my well, Luke 17, 20, and 21, I don't think is in there. I meant for it to be, but it isn't. But I, I go to this continuing, continuum, my favorite text, Romans 8, 11. The spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives within us. That kingdom of God, who he is through the Holy Spirit, lives in us. Kingdom of God and heaven being the same. John 14, 12. Do you have that one, Barry? That's, that's a text that just blew my mind away a few years ago when I really sat and thought about it. I tell you the truth. Why would he start with I tell you the truth? Probably because he didn't expect me to believe it. So as I'm telling you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works because I, Jesus, am going to be with the Father. The kingdom of heaven coming through Jesus. The kingdom of heaven living in us. And, uh, well, Mark mentioned the uh, camp meeting up in Calamesa. I was there the first two weeks of August. And uh, I heard a pastor speaking on, on some of this topic. And the idea of the kingdom is a growing reality. It, it's growing from a place where it affects some of the people some of the time. And over time, as we get closer to him, it becomes all of the people all of the time. But it's one kingdom. It's a kingdom we get to be part of. So that was one of my little diamonds. Got one more I want to share with you. And this one was really, uh, th this was just really cool. I won't tell you why Naomi left the table one morning for about 90 seconds, but I was like, okay, now what do I do? I'm all by myself, and I kind of don't want to eat. I'll just wait until she gets back to finish eating. And there I had a little book that I hadn't read for a while, and it, and it was sitting there, and I had a bookmark in it. So I pulled it out, and I started looking, and I couldn't believe this, this gem. 
How many have, have had the idea in their mind about how man sinned in the garden, and one man sins, we all sinned, right? But that sin can't go unpunished. That sin has, sin has to be dealt with. So God had to separate himself from his son, and he had to punish, he punished his son all the way to death, and all the horrible things that happened to Jesus, by the way, the movie and everything that was made doesn't even come close to what to the gruesomeness of what Jesus really experienced. And he went through all of this horrible stuff to appease an angry God. God had to be appeased. He had to be a judge. He had to do right. And the word that's usually preached on is propitiation. A meaning of appeasing or expatiating, X P A I A T I N G, something like that. Jesus taking our punishment to satisfy the need of punishment so we don't have to be punished. Because he was punished, we don't have to die. So we become this, we get into this thing about where was God during this? How did he get so angry at his own son? How did he, is he angry at us? And we're just lucky Jesus stepped in front and, and took all the blood and all the gore for us. Otherwise, man, we get messed up. What, what, what I read that day, and I, I went back and looked at the words and so on, was that there are two different ways that that phrase can be interpreted. There's two meanings, in other words, for the words that have almost always in theology been looked at as propitiation or the sort of the legal dealing with. And the second way that it can be translated is mercy seat. Where's the mercy seat? Was it in the Old Covenant, in the Ark of the Covenant, there was the mercy seat? Was the, old, was the priest in the Old Covenant really ticked off at that perfect lamb that was brought to him? Put that lamb up on the altar, take a knife and just mutilate that lamb. That lamb represented sin and he's going to... No, I'm, I'm picturing the priest seeing that perfect lamb, that, in, that lamb there that without blemish, just, just being his heart broken to, to kill... That, that little lamb there. In the same way, I don't see in the new covenant God just getting his pound of flesh. If something makes God angry or makes us think he's angry, it's probably the enemy speaking. And it's probably what he did at that point was probably an act of agape rather than an act of anger. Romans 5, 8, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Uh, you know, there's just different things. I, I was really looking to try to find a story or two that might make sense. And sometimes how we look at our dad, how we look at our God, and uh, this one just blew me. I, I, it's, an, it's an actual uh, true story. It was posted August 11. And that is, here's this rich kid with a billionaire, millionaire father. And he was tired of his old Ferrari. He didn't like his old Ferrari. It was, it was just an old $245,000 sports car. And he was really tired of it, but he didn't want to tell his dad. Uh, maybe he didn't want to tell his dad because it was only one of 15 cars that his dad gave his son. Uh, and he thought his dad wouldn't understand. So, um, oh, not to count that he gave his son 30 million in property and a 10,000 a month allowance. So, but he really didn't like that. So he hired a couple of his buddies and uh, they took and torched the Ferrari burned it to a crisp with the idea that then his dad would see this poor car got torched and then his dad would give him a new Ferrari, which was his goal. 
Sometimes we see things in a weird way. And I think of how how my understanding of God has changed. And I'm guessing that probably everyone here, if you think back to where you were last year, or five years, or 10 years, or 15 years ago, and you think of how you thought of God then and how you think of him now, that it's changed a little bit. Um, what I was trying to share with you today is that we're all evolving and changing in our journey. That our picture of God is really important. It, it really impacts everything. The kingdom of God is here and now, but it's also throughout eternity. There is a heaven, and I'm excited about it too. But God is not angry at us. He never really was. He just loves us. He wishes to live in us and live out of us. I'd, uh, the words will be up on the screen, and in conclusion, I want to sing the title of the sermon today, but I want, I'm hoping that you'll join and sing along with me, How Great is Our God.